They always ask me, what's that last, the next picture that I have here? That's Dominican Republic. If you have not gone there, it's a wonderful country. That's where I'm originally from. So it's not as old as Petra, and it's definitely not as old as Cincinnati. So uh, we're going to try to talk about inborn errors of metabolism in the ED, okay? Um, and, uh, okay, my objective today are initial evaluation, initial stabilization, initial therapy, when to consult specific intervention. Now, however, that is a very tricky thing. Why is it a very tricky thing? First of all, I'm not a geneticist. That's why we have Dr. Duzaki, Dazuki here, okay? Uh, second is 20 minutes. Uh, it is impossible, okay? And thirdly, I'm an educator, uh, so uh, when, you know, Hallett said, you need to talk about this, I say, wow, you're really my good friend. But I start to review and think how we're going to do it, and ultimately, I hope I'm not insulting you, I'm going to do it the same way that we do for our residents and our fellows, because it's a different approach when you're working in pediatric emergency medicine than when you're working in a typical um, uh, process of diagnosis, differential diagnosis. Because in the emergency room, as you all know, we always have to pick that big elephant that is in the waiting room that we do not know about it. We assume that every patient has a full stomach. We assume that nobody has a diagnosis, and we try to approach them all from the physiologic standpoint. So what are we talking about here? Okay, so if you believe me that the art of systematically approach the unknown to organize the chaos and to look beyond the obvious in the diagnosis to ensure the best for patient outcomes is pediatric emergency medicine. So we're gonna take you one good old day to our emergency department at Children's and that's where Ohio is right in the middle, up, oh, sorry, I moved the wrong way. That's in the middle of nowhere right there and that's where the hospital is in the city and this is the hospital. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you a Sunday afternoon, which is not busy, okay? And um, it is very organized, uh, and nobody's complaining about the waiting times in the emergency room. In particular, this year with H3 and 2, it's been a nightmare in there. So, since I say that these were my, my objectives, let's start with a simple one, with the original evaluation. So I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna give you a couple cases. So the first case, three week old, girl who presents to the emergency room with inconsolable crying, refusing the bottle, no history of fever, temperature of 37 degrees, heart rate of 150, respiratory rate of 25, uh, saturation is 100%, capri feel less than two seconds. Anybody has any thoughts? That's where I start talking to the residents. Of course, interestingly, okay, if you would not have had the title of the talk that says inborn errors of metabolism, right? You're probably going to start saying, oh, it could be abuse, it could be sepsis, it could be intussusception, it could be, you know, a lot of other things. It could be, it could be, it could be. And the first thing that we do to our residents, our fellows, is we do not care about theology at the beginning. So please do not think that way. I don't know how it's done in here, but traditionally there, you, the smarter you are is the vast your differential diagnosis. Uh, well, you know, but if you have a very long differential diagnosis and you never hit the target, you know, you may not be the most efficient and cost efficient uh, physician there. So what we try to do in emergency medicine is to introduce common medical errors that are very prominent in emergency medicine. And there's three of them, I'm not gonna spend this because that's a whole lecture by itself and a whole workshop as a matter of fact. There's three errors that we always worry. Technical errors, which is basically about knowledge. You need to know something, okay? Judgmental errors, which is diagnostic anchoring, that I'll talk in a second. Normative errors, which is selfishness, i.e., uh, let me give you an example. So one of my residents says, I think this patient has appendicitis. And I said to the resident, well, I think it could be an ovarian torsion. Why don't we call GYN and let's get an ultrasound to make sure. Here comes the consultation. Listen, I have this kid down here. I don't think she has an ovarian torsion, but my attending is asking me to call you to verify that. Okay, so that's called normative errors. If you ask for a consultant, give them facts. Takes away your own personal opinion. And distraction errors, which is what happens these days. Sensory overload, telephones, 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 and sensory overload. So why are these two so bad in pediatrics? In particular, pediatric emergency medicine. Because if you anchor from the beginning of a patient that comes to the emergency room with the wrong diagnosis, the rest of your approach will follow that and you're going to miss things. 
So it takes a lot to retrain the mind of a medical student, a resident, a fellow, to start saying it is okay not to have a diagnosis and to have a physiopathologic approach to the patient. So we teach them, and we're not gonna spend time on this because you know that this is my modum operandum, either the triangle of a quick evaluation or the cardiopulmonary assessment that, as you remember in previous ones, it goes to mental status, airway, breathing, circulation, pulse, pulse, capri field, temperature, and then you make an assessment. Stable, not a stable, respiratory compromise or not, cardiovascular compromise or not, then you take a deep breath and you start working the patient up. But you don't start working the patient up before you solve that issue. Having that in mind, if we go back to the same case, I apologize, I went to three to two weeks, this is the same girl. And when you do the rapid cardiopulmonary assessment, everything was perfect, nothing, no fever, nothing, everything looks fine, and it happened that she had a corneal abrasion, or she could have had a little hair tourniquet and had nothing. But we could have ended doing a spinal tap, ammonia, glucose, and everything else because we didn't spend time to do a good physical exam, which is the second thing that we tell our residents. Now, it gets more interesting. So let's take the same case again, and let's just change a word. Perfect case, the only difference is at home you have temperature of 38.9 degrees. And the residents go through the same thing, and then they miss in there, oh my goodness, what's the diagnosis? Okay, you got a four to six second cap refill, you have someone that has an issue, and they go back to the diagnosis and we fool them and we say, we don't want the diagnosis, we don't want the theology, you have to tell me that this patient, either through this or this, it has shock. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, in most of the studies going on right now, the delay in the recognition of shock has nothing to do that we don't recognize the signs and symptoms. It's that we're afraid to use the word shock. And if you use it, everything goes at a certain speed. If you don't use it and you say the Capri field is delay, everything goes in a different speed, okay? So what's my next step? After I sort of brainwashed them to say, don't do diagnostic anchoring, do a cardiopulmonary assessment, and then let's start thinking, what are we going to do? The next step is the stabilization. And for that, it hasn't changed. Oxygen, you're constipated, you get oxygen. You have attention deficit hyperactive disorder, you get oxygen. You have hypoglycemia, you get oxygen before hypoglycemia, you get everything. Because ultimately, the brain wants two things, right? Glucose and oxygen. And if it doesn't have the blood that takes it there, you're in deep problem. Vascular access, no question about it. We talked about before in previous years, 90 seconds for the IV. If not, you get your IO, your IJ, monitors, temperature. And most important this day and age is the mental model. For some reason, physicians were trained to think outside, when in reality, we need to think out loud. Because when you're thinking out loud, first of all, you're questioning yourself, and second, you're asking your team to give you an input of what's going on, your nurses, your residents, your fellows, even yourself. So there's plenty of equipments out there. There's not too many modifications, except that the new monitors now tells you if you need to do CPR. Hopefully, we don't need to go there. It even tells you how fast and how deep you need to go. Laryngoscopes, we use video now because it's much more accurate and safe. And the reason why is because before, as you remember, when a resident or fellow tried to put the ET tube down, it's, I think I'm going there. And now we want to know if you're going there in the wrong place. But anyway. We use the intraosseous to not lose time. I'm not going to show you the video because you know it. And ultimately what we want is that patient, which we didn't label with the diagnosis, that we did a rapid cardiopulmonary assessment and said that the patient is critically ill, that could be in shock in this case, I don't care what type, needs to be approached very fast. And then you're going to use an logarithm, which we usually encourage and have it on the phones or on TV, because we try to avoid doctors to use recall memory. It's been proven that in stress situations, there is a shunt from your cortex to your anal sphincter. The blood goes very fast in that direction and you become dumb in the stress situation. So we don't want you to use recall memory in the stress situation. We want you to be so clear that you can put it on a piece of paper and read it out loud. This is what you need to do. If you look at PALS, I love when we're training people in resuscitation because it says, two minutes, cardiac compression. Give epi, two minutes, cardiac compression. And people are trying to memorize, do I do the cardiac compression? It's there, read it, because we don't want that. So, what am I talking about? I'm supposed to be talking about inborn errors of metabolism, right? Well, let me give you these two cases. 
First case, do we call nothing wrong? Just irritable. Second case, fever and probably septic in shock. Do you think they're gonna come in the forehead and says this is an inborn metabolism? Guess what? This one was galactosemia. Both of them. The first one because of irritability, the second one, urosepsis that the E. coli is related. So what I'm trying to say, if you think that they come with a diagnosis, very few of them don't do. Some hopefully been picked up by the newborn screening and some bodies have some changes in the phenotype that you can sort of identify. Well, we, genetic, we emergency room physicians are, you know, unlikely to make that diagnosis. So how can we teach then to do it the right way? First rule of engagement, technology versus memory. Believe it or not, this is our resus one of the res four resuscitation rooms. Behind the patient head, there is a screen. At the foot of the patient head is a screen. So the entire team can see vital times, vital signs, the entire team can see where their logarithms, if you're doing something that is clinically pathway driven is. If there's any procedures, everybody can see it. But most importantly, if you have any questions about anything, you pull up in the computer and try to look for it. So let's assume for a little fact that you know that in this patient, there is a metabolic inborn error, okay? That you're suspicious about it. We pulled the New England control team of programs, uh, metabolic programs, and we put in there what we're thinking, and it tells you exactly what we need to do. Other patients will come to a little letter, or it's in the medical record, okay, and then you work them up. But yeah, that works if you're prepared, you're ready, you know you have them. I still have not solved my problem as an emergency room physician, how should I manage them? So you need to know a little bit about it. So these are the facts that I am interested in as an emergency room physician. There are more than 5,000 identified, hence I cannot memorize them. Rule one. Two, the overall rate, it's unusual, but if you put them all together, it's not as uncommon, so I need to think about them. Remember, I don't need to memorize them, but I need to constantly think about them. They all have common symptoms, like those that come in common illnesses. So I need to have my ears and eye open because that zebra is in the waiting room, okay? Always think about them in the ill neonate. They tend to be in the little kiddos because the older ones probably are the ones that have the diagnosis make, made. So you should be able to stratify that way. And in the EV, the most important step is not the diagnosis, but the stabilization, samples for the future. So Dr. Dazuki say, hey, look what we found in there. Um, diagnosis and stop metabolic cascade causing damage. So how do we go about that? Well. You need to think about it in a simplistic way. Either there is enzyme defect or deficiency, there is enzyme cofactor deficiency, there's transport enzyme defect, or there's a blockade in the metabolic process. But the EM approach is, I know what they have, or I don't know what they have, from the standpoint of inborn errors of metabolism, because each one of them gives me a little bit of a different path. Now, we got to this point with the residents and fellow, now we need to say, okay, so Dr. G, so how are we gonna approach them? If you say they're 5,000, you're not gonna memorize them, but they look so common that it's gonna be like a call sometimes. Well, the good thing is when you start thinking about them, there is common denominators in all of them. And as a matter of fact, there's common denominators in the original and the initial approach. In general, you have to think about them of any neonate that it doesn't fit the mold. Don't try to put that square plug in a round thing. There's something unusual, keep about it, okay? In general, look at the symptoms. As a matter of fact, they're all symptoms that you may be thinking other things that has nothing to do with inborn error metabolism. Some people even have tried to classify. You cannot read it and I don't want you to read it because this is a, a Brazilian study that said, if you have A, B, C, and D, and E, you can have this. Like I have the time to start, okay, you have A, two, three, and the kid is in shock dying on me. Now it doesn't work that way. So, if you have a suspicious, you have a patient that you're starting to stabilize, right? I don't need the diagnosis to stabilize. Um, how do I approach if I am thinking of known um, inborn errors? Common lab results that are gonna hinge in that direction are hypoglycemia, hyperammonemia, acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, hepatic dysfunction, reducing substance in and ketones. And I think Dr. Dazuki mentioned those in his original presentation. So, 
What's the original initial stabilization? Same as shock, same as any other patient that is sick. You make the mental model, you think, I'm treating a sepsis, but there's something unusual at this kid. I am suspicious that could be an inborn error of metabolism. So, initial therapy. This is what we all teach our residents and fellows to start with. Is a no harm, resuscitate, and stabilize. So the first thing is MPO. Most of the things is because you could be putting something, protein or some other type of sugars in there, that is not good. So keep the patient MPO until further notice. Your ABCs, Ds, and Es needs to come in there and start with the simplest thing of all, lactated rangers. Resuscitate and sit tight. Yes, some people say, what about lactated rangers? Uh, it's too expensive, the shelf life is very um, uh, small. You have to replace those bags every two to three weeks, at least in our system, and you have lactate. So you may start doing some things that you may not like with the system. Glucose is of paramount importance. You need to maintain it. I'm not talking about only an inborn errors metabolism. A patient in shock, most of the major issues is they become hypoglycemic, you resuscitate them, but the sugar is not there, start seizing, like you know, other you know, peers were saying, you're in trouble. You took him out of shock, but the glucose is zero. What are you gonna do with that patient? So keep the glucose and it's recommended one and a half maintenance. Fix the metabolic acidosis. But if this was in Spanish, have you heard the music? Despacito, right? Okay, so that's what we say in English, slowly. If you're going to fix the pH, okay, you do it very slowly. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be very strong suggesting that you contact your consultant when you start discussing about that. Remember, when you use by car, you go from NH4, NH3, the blood brain barrier changes and you can start getting more into your CNS and it can get a little bit uh, um, difficult. And then you consult your expert because what comes afterwards, it's to eliminate toxins. And now you're talking serious stuff. You're talking about hemodialysis, you're talking about phenyl acetate for a hip hyperammonemia with arginine or without not arginine or cofactors uh, that are listed in there. We do not teach our guys to be being any one of those unless one of my consultants is involved or unless the diagnosis was made and the patient comes with a little letter that says, I have this, begin sugar, don't be stupid, and give me carnitine. Okay, thank you very much. Here we go. We're going to start it, okay? Now, consultations I don't need to spend too much time because that's when you go and talk about if you have something known. But this is the emergency view of known um, inborn errors of metabolism. Look at the list, and I'm actually getting, getting short on these things. This is the organic acidemia. And by the way, there's a very nice review paper for the Middle East when I was reviewing just to make sure that I become a little smarter about <laughs> this. Um, you're, I think you're, the highest incidence of fatty acids and orgasic acidemias is in this area of the world. But if you look at the labs, don't try to memorize them. What I want you to think is if you take all these labs, look at the common denomination that all of the ones are going to have. The ED management is the same. MPO, IV maintenance, sugar for the hypoglycemia, correct the acidosis, and consider hyperammonemia. It's like, wow, you know, that's one, Javier. What about the others? Well, let's just think about your cycle defects. These are all your potential ones. Again, look at what happens when you're in the management. Acidosis, hypoglycemia, hyperammonemia, avoid valproic acid, that's a different story. But look at the three friends in there. If I go into the defects of production, utilization, or intolerance, I got my list of diagnoses that I remember that I told you I'm not gonna memorize that much, okay? And then when you go to the management, acidosis and hypoglycemia. So all of a sudden we're moving, and in all of the ones, you see a pattern. So even for the known inborn errors of metabolism, the ones that even have a phenotype out there, from the emergency room standpoint, we follow the same sequence. And the same sequence is, if you do not know, you ask. In the interim, you do your stabilization of normal saline, give the glucose, keep an MTO, and fix the things that you need to fix. And do not start anything until your consultants or you know for a fact that can use these things. So, in summary, because it's 20 minutes, you now can find the zebra in the middle. 
But the zebra, not because of the diagnosis. It's because that patient is going to probably be very sick if he's not diagnosed or decompensates it very fast if he's a diagnosed one. When you do that, what you're going to do is forget that your brain wants to pull you in a diagnosis and say, am I stable or non-stable? Because you can be talking about yourself, and I just made a diagnosis of maple syrup disease, and disease, and the child is, <gasps> and let me quote Professor Dazuki, because I think this is the case, and do you think we can run a chromatographic analysis of the urine to see, <gasps> and that's what you want to avoid, because ultimately, the stabilization is the same for everybody. You want oxygen, you want vascular access, monitors, temperature control. You want to think out loud, and that's why you want to get your consultants in there. And remember that now, for the known or the unknown, for a simple pediatric emergency room physician, we follow normal saline, we avoid lactated rangers, we maintain a glycemia to the point that we are very happy with it, we keep them MPO, we monitor very carefully the um, metabolic acidosis. We correct very slowly that bicarb. We send samples. As a matter of fact, even for the samples, you have to be careful because if you put a tourniquet and you try to send an ammonia sample from a tourniquet, it's going to be altered and you need to put them on ice, et cetera, et cetera. Consult your experts so they will give you what to do afterwards. Make sure that you never use your memory, okay, because it doesn't work. And with those, I think I've covered it. We're back in time. And I just want to say something that uh, Osler said, the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So concentrate on the physiopathologic approach, resuscitate the patient, consult and ask the questions later, and do no harm. Thank you very much.